All right, hey guys. Uh, we are going to talk to you a little bit about some Thunderbolt DMA attacks. Um, so let's get to it. Uh, this is Sam. <laughs> press, press button. There you go. Hello. Hey, uh, I'm Sam. I'm a PhD student at the University of Auckland, uh, and my research is on ray tracing on FPGAs. And I have an extensible collection of hair tags here. <laughs> Of name tags and hairnets. Uh, I'm Snare or Lucas. Uh, I am a computer nerd at Asima Security uh, with, with Meowbiz. And uh, you might remember me from Syscan 2012 where I did some, uh, spoke a little bit about EFI uh, boot kits and that sort of, sort of junk. So uh, also, I'm, that's me in the corner down there. Um, and I'm apparently the world's strongest millionaire, if you believe my Twitter profile. Um, yeah, so on to the more interesting stuff. So uh, basically, we, you know, um, Sam and I both independently uh, decided to look into uh, doing DMA attacks over Thunderbolt um, because apparently they were totally a thing and everyone just knows that it's, that it's possible and blah, blah, blah. Um, we hadn't actually seen a real proof of concept that wasn't cheating with Firewire. So um, Sam is an FPGA nerd and, you know, I'm an OS and firmware kind of guy. So, you know, I, I, was, I was looking into this and, and uh, realized that FPGAs are actually pretty hard when you're a software guy and you're not an engineer. Um, so Sam and I got together and started working on this together. So um, it's not actually about lightning. The talk title is a little bit misleading. Sorry, Stefan, I know you wanted, you know, some lightning stuff in there, but yeah. Uh, so the, the things that we're gonna go through today, uh, I'll go into a little bit of background about how Firewire DMA attacks work um, and why, what the limitations are and what sort of uh, those limitations we can overcome using Thunderbolt. Uh, then a little bit about Thunderbolt, how it works. Uh, then Sam's gonna go into uh, PCI Express, the inner workings of all that stuff and how FPGAs do their thing. And uh, then sort of how we can apply uh, that to attacking Thunderbolt. And then we're gonna do a sweet stunt hack demo with this like ostentatious piece of equipment. Um, and hopefully it will work. And if it doesn't, we'll probably show you a video. Uh, and then I guess because, you know, it seems to be the, be the responsible thing to do. We'll talk a little bit about defense. Yep. So Firewire DMA attacks have been around for quite a while now, I guess. Um, Metal Storm, Adam Metal Storm by Low down here, the beardy looking guy with the Kiwi accent, uh, probably one of three or four metalheads here. Um, did some cool work in about 2006 um, called Hit by a Bus at Roxcon in Australia. Uh, where he, he built this thing called Winlock Pwn and you can plug, you know, Firewire, two Firewire computers together and, um, and you know, use one to, to do direct memory access reads and writes to the other one. Um, and it, this, this technique was actually first uh, sort of just, uh, demonstrated by this crazy Apple guy called Quinn the Eskimo, who if you've ever uh, sent emails to the Darwin Kernel mailing list, you might have got some really smart answers from him before being yelled at by like Shan or one of those other guys that don't like us hackers. Um, so he actually like, plugged two computers together via Firewire and used his attack machine to directly write to the frame buffer on the other computer and like, built a screensaver that was, you know, he could display on the other computer over Firewire, which is pretty badass, if you ask me. Um, so the, the, the modern sort of uh, implementation of this uh, technique or like Metal Storm's Winlock Pwn type thing is uh, Inception, which is a you know, pretty common tool for forensic analysis stuff because you can plug it into, you can plug two machines together by Firewire and just dump all the memory out um, over the Firewire and you know, volatility it up and uh, dig out all the fun malware and whatever else. So it basically works by using SPP2, uh, which is a sort of part of the Firewire specification. Uh, the Firewire chipset is connected to the PCIe bus, and then you know do you, your um, attack machine tells the uh, target machine's Firewire chipset to do DMA reads and writes on its behalf, and then sends them back over the Firewire interface. Looks something like this. So we've got the target host with MCH. Probably should also say CPU, but it's not really relevant. So you've got Firewire chipset, um, PCI bus, memory controller, and then the memory. You connect the analysis or attack host, depending on the context of your research or whatever, uh, via, uh, up via Firewire. And then over the SBP2 protocol, the analysis or attack host uh, tells the, the remote Firewire chipset um, to do a DMA read. And then it goes and does it over the PCI Express bus and then sends the data back. So pretty straightforward. 
So there's a few limitations with FireWire DMA. Um, for starters, there has to be a FireWire interface, kind of you know, out of favor now, I guess. Um, you can cheat if you've got a machine with Thunderbolt and just attach a FireWire uh, interface, so you know, that's still pretty easy, I guess. Um, FireWire only uses 32-bit addressing, um, so you can sort of only grab the lower four gigs of RAM. I think there's some other extensions that allow you to do other things, but I don't know all that much about FireWire. So, um, More importantly, though, on OS X, which is sort of my main area of interest and Sam's main area of interest, uh, FireWire DMA is disabled when you have FileVault turned on and you lock the screen. So the FireWire driver um, has a little bit of code that you know says if, if we're in secure mode in the kernel, which in that context it just means that you've got FileVault turned on, uh, when the screen's locked, it tells the FireWire chipset, don't do DMA anymore, that's a no-no, don't, don't be bad. Um, so basically you can't do like you know, screen unlock stunt hacks and, and memory dumping on a locked machine that has FileVault turned on. And if you don't have FileVault turned on, you deserve it, so whatever. So onto Thunderbolt. Uh, Thunderbolt is basically just PCI Express and DisplayPort glued together with a couple of GPIO lines for some other signaling and power management and whatever else, and then some pixie dust, Intel proprietary magic. So it's a 10 or 20 gigabit um, full duplex fancy serial connection thing. Uh, if you look really closely on, on friendly marketing diagram there, you can see the pixie dust right there. Um, yeah. So We've you know, figured, okay, so we can probably, it's got PCIe in there somewhere, we can probably just send DMA reads and writes directly over PCI Express, tunnel over, over Thunderbolt, right? So that seems pretty, pretty sane, I guess. So uh, we've got a slightly more useful diagram here um, with you know, the, the PCH there being, I guess, the, the new south bridge and then the north bridge being up in the, uh, the processor and then the Thunderbolt controller there connected via four lanes of PCI Express to the uh, PCH. Um, so basically the, the, the Thunderbolt DMA attacks, or the DMA attacks that we've seen so far that have been done uh, over uh, Thunderbolt uh, are pretty much just FireWire. So people are taking a, a, a Thunderbolt to FireWire adapter, plugging it into the FireWire port, and then it's using FireWire. So it's subject to the same limitations that uh, an older machine with FireWire on board um, is subject to. So it's, you know, uh, you know, Inception says, oh, you know, it supports Thunderbolt. It doesn't really support Thunderbolt. just, you know, allows you to use a Thunderbolt-connected device with a FireWire chipset on it. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's basically subject to the same limitations. So, yeah. So Sam's going to go into a little bit of PCI Express in our workings. Cool. Okay. So PCI Express is basically the love child of PCI and PCIX. Uh, it's a serial point-to-point -point interface, uh, and it consists of lanes, and a lane has a uh, transmit and receive differential pair, so there are a total of four wires per lane, and basically a differential pair is two complementary signals which reduce kind of, well, sorry, increase resistance to electromagnetic noise on like a high-speed bus. Uh, so the number of lanes is scalable, and it's negotiated uh, at link setup time, typically to the maximum number of lanes that both devices can support. It is a layered packet-based transaction protocol. So there's a physical layer which contains all your clocking and your synchronization resources. Uh, there's a data link layer which is all your um, transaction uh, limiting and power management stuff. And there's a transaction layer which I'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, it also supports level sensitive or message signaled interrupts. So on that transaction layer, there are four transaction types. Uh, there's an I.O. read-write, which is just legacy stuff to support uh, for backwards compatibility with PCI. Uh, there are configuration reads and writes, which are reads and writes to the configuration space on each device. Uh, and this configuration space basically contains the capabilities, uh, the status, and control registers for the device. Uh, there's memory reads and writes, which are, you know, that's, that's how you transfer data on the bus. That's basically what we're interested in. Yeah, and there's messaging. So to do DMA on PCI Express, uh, you hook up your device. The operating system is going to read from the configuration space to figure out the device ID and the vendor ID of the device. It's then going to load uh, the, a driver for the, those IDs, if it has one, and that driver is going to go and 
grant this device as a bus master, which means it can do those reads and writes. Uh, once it's done that, the driver will write um, target addresses and the command it wants the device to do. It will tell it to start, and then the device goes and um, does the memory reads and writes and interrupts the operating system when it's finished. So an FPGA is a field programmable gate array. Uh, it's like a programmable integrated circuit, and they were invented by Xilinx back in 1984. Um, there are matrix of configurable logic blocks which um, uh, contain slices, and your typical slice contains uh, lookup tables, flip flops, a carry chain, and multiplexes. And this is like the core functionality of an FPGA. So, for each device family, there are also uh, additional generic features like block RAMs, FIFOs, DSPs, and clocking resources like phase lock loops and DCMs meaning you can have lots of different uh, clock frequencies running all around your board for different parts of your logic. And then specific to each kind of uh, device, there are things like a PCI Express Core, an Ethernet Core, or a DDR2 or 3 uh, controller. Things that uh, it's easy to implement direct hardware for rather than implement it in logic because it, it requires a lot higher speed than the typical FPGA fabric. Uh, and they're also reprogrammable, which is a really big advantage over like an ASIC when you're designing or prototyping something, because um, you know, you, also you can um, send out updates to your device once it's been made, like you can just send out a, a new bit stream to your device and reprogram it if you've got an update to it. So um, like if you're update your Proxmark, you're going to send down the bit stream and the OS and the bootloader and well, they're all, you know, can be updated independently. Yeah. Um, it's also like, they're generally cheaper than an ASIC in kind of small to medium volumes. So how do you turn your logic, like how do you implement that on FPGA? So say you've got this logic up here on your left hand side, basically what you're going to do is you're going to run through every single combination of input and determine the output for that logic. So that's going to give you this truth table like you've got here. And then you use the, the output of that truth table, which is the right hand column, and you're going to use that to initialize the, the lookup table on the FPGA. So essentially, the lookup table is a six input memory, and it contains the output for each set of those addresses or inputs. Um, so it really doesn't matter how complex your logic is. It can be far more complex than this, but as long as it's got six, uh, six inputs, you, know, you can implement it on a, lo a, lo a single lookup table as well. So to um, describe your logic, you use a hardware description language like Verilog or VHDL. Um, so you can, you can write this uh, VHDL or Verilog and you leave it up to a synthesis tool to, um, to infer all the logic that you want in your lookup tables, but it's really important to understand how the underlying FPGA stuff works because um, you know, you're, not writing, you're not really writing software, you're configuring the hardware. So you, you really want to know what the code you're writing is actually going to turn into, otherwise you get like horribly performing logic if you are like really careless with your code. So the maximum performance or the frequency of your um, design is determined by the, the levels of logic there are. And a level of logic is a combination of logic delay and routing delay between two flip-flops or synchronous elements in your design. So your lookup table um, delay, that's like a static constant property of your device that you're using, and the routing delay is determined by how close you place all your logic to each other. So if you reduce your levels of logic, or you can place your lookup tables close together, you can get a, a higher performance or higher clock frequency. So one other thing you can uh, implement on an FPGA is it's called a microblaze, and it's a, it's a microcontroller written in like written in VHDL, uh, and it's really, um, you know, and it interfaces on a, what's called an AXI bus, uh, and that's a standard interface, so you can hook up lots of other things to it and memory map them, and you just write code in C or C++, compile it into an ELF, and like all you're doing is doing reads and writes on this bus, and um, it's really good for, it's really good for control logic. Um, where previously you'd have to write really large state machines in HDL, which are quite error prone and hard to debug. As we found at KiwiCon without demonstration that didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and it also means your, your software developer or someone can write code and maintain code for your design as well, like this snare guy over here. T turns out FPGAs are kind of hard when you're a software guy. V you know, VHDL and Verilog look like code, but really it's, you know, engineering. So, I don't know. <laughs> so, you can also connect to the Microblaze uh, via serial and get a console up on it. And that means you can print F, debug your logic, which is really, really handy. Like, you spend a bit chip of time. Yeah, you spend a bit of time using chip scope, which is you're basically putting a logic analyzer inside the FPGA. And it's really, really hard to kind of trigger on events which you want to monitor and capture the right kind of stuff. It's really painful. So being able to print F everything as you go is, is really useful. When, when we were developing the first version of this, Sam was at my place for a week. He lives in New Zealand, I live in Australia, so he came over for a week. And he was sitting there most of the time looking at uh, the, out, like the chip scope output of PCI Express packets captured. Um, using chip scope and looking at the individual bits and going, yeah, that's a, uh, oh, fuck. There's no, no, no wire shark, you know, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really hard to debug this kind of stuff. So how do we do PCI Express on an FPGA? Uh, well, the Xilinx toolkit, uh, toolkit that we're using has a... <laughs> is that intentional? Cause no. <laughs> tool shit. It really is. A, that tool chain is a piece of shit. Yeah. Um, so it's got a, a PCI core which we can hook up to the AXI bus and it uses those device specific features to implement uh, the, not the, the data link layer of PCI Express for us. So it's memory mapped and so any reads or writes we do over AXI to this core is going to translate them into those memory read and write TLPs on the transaction bus for us. And then any reads or writes which come in from PCI Express, it's going to translate to reads and writes on the AXI bus for us. So there's a whole bunch of peripherals, like soft and hard peripherals that all support AXI, so it's pretty easy to just you know, take someone else's code from open cores or, or, or you know, existing Xilinx IP and you know, hook it up to the AXI bus and you, know, you can talk to it from microblayers from C and it's yeah, nice and clean. Yeah. So um, basically to attack Thunderbolt or to attack a Mac using uh, PCI Express, we, we need to become bus master first so we can do all these reads and writes that we want. So this is the kind of, uh, this is kind of how we want our architecture to look like. We've got our target host here with our Thunderbolt controller in it and we're going to extend the PCI Express bus using a uh, Thunderbolt to PCI Express adapter and hook it up to our FPGA. So what we actually end up with, next is this here. So, hang on a sec. So the, the, uh, I think it's important to note is that basically the PX, PCI bus is, is extended out the Thunderbolt port, comes out the other side, at the, outside the other, the other Thunderbolt chipset. So it's basically, you know, you're actually, it, it's basically the same as sticking a PCI Express card into the machine, but it's, you know, hot plug, whatever else. So it's like, like Express card or, you know, PC card or whatever. Yeah, cool. So this is what we end up with. We've got, we've got our target host there connected via Thunderbolt to our, um, Thunderbolt to PCI Express adapter, and the DSL2210 on there, that's the, uh, that's the Thunderbolt controller. Uh, we connect that then via PCI Express to our FPGA development board, and on that we've implemented that AXI PCIe core, and we hook it up to a microblaze, which we then talk to via serial on our analysis host. So the circuitry handles the, that physical layer of PCI Express, and this AXI PCI core handles the data link layer for us. We write um, the C for this microblaze, which does reads and writes to that core, which performs those reads and writes over PCI Express to the target host for us. So, the um, basically the approach that we've taken here, uh, as you know, we've, we've, so we've got our, our uh, you know FPGA dev board connected up to PCI Express, connected into the Mac via Thunderbolt. So what we now need to do is. Um, uh, somehow become bus master. So originally what we, what we did to just sort of get started and, and, and get testing with it is uh, wrote a kernel driver for, for Mac OS that uh, you know, makes, makes our, you know, detects our board and then, and then sets it with the, with the bus master enable flag and then uh, we communicate with it via you know, uh, like IO space reads and writes or, uh, to, the, to the FPGA to registers in, in uh, a custom like um, finite state machine that Sam wrote for, for it. Um, and sort of tell it what to do directly from our driver. So it's, it's pretty easy to interface with, well, it was pretty easy to interface with at the, in the early stages of development stuff. Um, then 
So basically, we're cheating then because you know the, t the, the idea is that we're not going to have access to the host that we're attacking. So we're kind of cheating by talking to it and, and configuring it over, over uh, the Thunderbolt connection. So the next phase was to then imitate a device, um, a, a legitimate device that uh, it's whose driver will set Busmaster and, and and let it you know go to go to town on the on the on the DMAs. So we chose the Apple SDXC device because it was, you know, supports, uh, has the IOPCI tunnel flag in the driver, which means it's allowed to be connected over Thunderbolt. Um, and then, so we basically just set in the, in the FPGA and the config registers, set the device ID and vendor ID to match that, that device. Enough, you know, enough configuration to, um, to satisfy IOKit's matching requirements so that when IOKit, you know, looks at the device and goes, okay, it's a PCI device, it's got this vendor ID, this, this product ID, goes through all the IOKit matching bullshit with the, crazy way that that works, and then it finds this Apple SDXC driver, loads it, the driver goes, yeah, that looks kind of like my device, it's cool, and, and it sets Busmaster. Yeah, so, um, so the actual uh, like proof of concept uh, that we're gonna show you shortly, um, basically the proof of concept is uh, pretty much the way that Inception works, uh, and we, ha we take a, a machine that's locked, it's on, uh, it's running, but it's, the screen is locked, uh, and we're going to uh, write, you know, search through memory and find the piece of code that's responsible for the authentication um, mechanism. So every time any authentication uh, happens in, on Mac OS, it goes through Open Directory, whether it's you know LDAP or it's flat file stuff or it's NIS or whatever. Uh, it all goes through this this same this one same routine that checks, you know, goes through and, and works out what Open Directory's configuration is and, and does the actual authentication, and then it returns. Uh, just you know, a one or a zero to say yes, you're allowed to log in, or no, you're not allowed to log in. Um, so that little bit of code there, we basically just patch it so that the um, move uh, B, BL into AL uh, is just move one into AL. So it just always returns one, and that's basically how Inception works as well. Um, this is not the same payload because we uh, <laughs> we actually uh, only wrote this originally for 10.8, 10 and then realized when we got here that we didn't have a 10.8 machine. So last night we rewrote it for 10.9, had to build a new payload and reverse the, uh, the open directory um, function for 10.9, and yeah, so, but um, it all works, so it's fine. <laughs> it helps to have a couple of beers as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so basically after that you can type in whatever password you want, hit enter, and it will log in. Right, so this is our FPGA development board here. It's right here, but we can't really hold it up because it's all wired in and stuff. Yeah. So. And so that, that's the development board there. That, uh, there is the actual FPGA. So as you can see, it, it's pretty small compared to the size of the board, but there's a whole lot of uh, I.O. and peripherals and things on there and power management and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this is the Thunderbolt PCI board. Which um, the vendor has since recalled all of these and uh, offered me twice what I paid for it and a voucher for their web store if I sent it back to them. So I'm like, no, I, I want that because there's a good reason that you want it back. Um, and after talking to some people at Intel, I suspect that perhaps they're trying to do Thunderbolt certification and they don't want any of their engineering samples out in the wild anymore, so. Or well, they're getting sued to shit. Yeah. Um, so we connect that to the Thunderbolt, to the, to the development board by uh, the PCI Express connector. It's the same as like a typical graphics card. And then we connect that, the Thunderbolt connector off to our target. Uh, on the FPGA, we also connect the JTAG and UART to our attacking PC, and so the JTAG is used to program the FPGA, and the UART's where we connect to serial to the microblaze. Then we connect Thunderbolt to the victim. So, uh, in case you missed that, uh, we've got Garth here, who will uh, give us a little explanation. Ah, oh, the sound in. Let's just get that. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear that. Well, yeah, that's I forgot to plug the sound in, it's fine. Where's Failey? Failey set the sound up. Where's Failey? Failey Monster? Hi. Sweet. Oh wait, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's actually oddly appropriate. We haven't done the demo yet, but that didn't work, so yeah. that's Otter Storm. Sweet. All right, All right so it's demo time. Demo, yeah. can, can someone get me a beer, please? <laughs> beer? No? Sorry. Thanks, Metal. <laughs> All, right, All right, so bring up this serial console. Oh, yeah. So what we're going to do is we've got our um, this guy here, serial console. So uh, just using screen to connect to the UART over the USB 
uh, connected connection thingy. It's, it's got a like USB to UART, like USB to serial chip on the board to talk to the UART. Right. So here we have our locked. Uh, what is it? How old is this machine? Uh, it's a Sandy Bridge machine. So it's 2011 or something like that, but it's running 1092. All right. So we're going to hook up Thunderbolt to it now. Maybe. Hopefully. Oh wait. Oh. So should probably like show them uh, failing auth. Oh yeah. So if we just type in like you know some stuff and hit and hit return or space and hit return, it doesn't log in, right? So that's clearly not the password. Yeah. And it's it's clearly locked. I'm so glad I changed my password from space for this demonstration. <laughs> that was cheating, yeah. <gasps> Thanks, Metal. You're the best. We're actually going to get Metal Storm to help us out by um, coming and typing in uh, a dummy password in a second as well. All right, so we've hooked up, we've hooked up Thunderbolt to it. Uh, the, so the top line is the PCI Express link coming up. And the second line is the driver giving us bus master. And now we're free to do whatever we want. So. I think we're going to want to go and, yeah, so this is the code we've written on the Microblaze, just our little function of stuff we can do. Uh, and so we're going to go and unlock this, this Mac. So it's going to scan through all the memory, looking for this pattern. It's found a match and it's patched it with that return one. Uh, we'll just let it run to the end because it, it can find a couple of these in memory or it finds the pattern somewhere else and patches something that's not the thing. But, might need uh, to refine our signatures <laughs> a little bit. But, but yeah. okay, so it's only found one now, and we'll need our volunteer to come and enter a password for us. Maybe not your own password, just, just mash the <laughs> No, it's keyboard. fine, your, your own password's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and it's logged in. I'm so glad that worked. Yeah. And I apologize for the Otis one. Uh, what? The first time ever. Yeah, first time ever. Yeah. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. So we also made a video, um, which we'll, we'll also show you. I think so it's, it's probably pretty, pretty hard to see <laughs> all this stuff from where you are. So uh, here is a video of the same thing. There's me using space to try and log in. Not working. Boo. <laughs> Hook it up. You're going to see the same stuff here on the console. The link comes up. It gets bus master. We've got our terminal. We type unlock. Searching, searching, searching. It's found a match and it's patched it. And we just let it, we'll let it go through again. And we're going to try space as the password again once, it, uh, once it's finished. And we're in. Victory order. Yeah. <laughs> oh, noes. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray. So, um, this all. Uh, <laughs> so, this all seems kind of bad, right? Um, doesn't seem like a great thing to be able to do. So, Intel realized this a while ago, um, sort of. They, yeah, anyway, so basically there's, there's, there's a few, you know, a few, few ways we can, we can approach fixing this problem. So you can glue all the ports shut, which is obviously not really appropriate. Um, you know, you guys might think it is, I might think it is, but, you know, people that are normal people that use computers probably don't. I, my, my travel machine, by the way, I actually broke the Thunderbolt port on. I think I killed the Thunderbolt controller when we were doing this stuff um, early on. And now, now the Thunderbolt doesn't work, so it's now the perfect travel laptop. Don't even have to glue the ports shut. Um, so next option, probably not, probably not a voodoo curse, I guess. Um, so we're going to put access controls on, on, on devices, uh, device I/O, right? So Intel made this thing called VTD, um, which they, I mean, that it's the, for them it's a virtualization technology. It, it's kind of, kind of a side effect, I guess. It's you know partly designed for security and partly designed for um, you know partitioning the I/O space. So basically, it's virtualized I/O. So the hypervisor can now take a device and assign it directly to a VM guest. So it's kind of the way that um, VM Direct Path works, and you know all of those similar kinds of um, differently named technologies that are all exactly the same thing. So the the VM the VMM can can assign a device to uh, to a, to a guest, and DMA requests uh, and interrupts are all remapped by the, in, the, the VTD unit. So, um, 
VCD, the v VCD unit basically has these, uh, what it calls domains, which is, you know, uh, really they tend to map one to one to, um, to guests and or to, to, uh, to VMs, including the host. So there's always at least one domain, which is the host domain, uh, sorry, the, the host uh, VMs domain, I guess. Um, uh, so in order to actually assign a, a device to a guest, the, v the VMM is going to create a domain for that guest and assign a device to it, and then uh, you know all the other devices go in the host domain. So that, you know that one domain uh, then gets assigned to the, to the guest, and uh, it can ac access the device, and no one else can access it. So um, macOS actually uh, configures the VTD uh, unit. Uh, through the IOPCI family driver. So when that gets loaded, there's, uh, if you have a look in the source code, there's a file called vtd.c. It's a huge fucking mess um, with lots of commented out code. And, yeah, it is horrible code. It's pretty funny. Um, but yeah, so basically it just creates the one with the single VTD domain. I mean, you know, it's, it's not really a hypervisor as such, but it's, you know, wants to use it as a security mechanism. So it creates this one single domain. Um, uh, yeah, and, and assigns all the devices to it. Um, you, you know, you can also apply access controls to devices within that domain as well. So, basically, now when it, when drivers allocate DMA buffers um, in order to communicate with their device, so the device can do DMA writes. You know, so a graphics card can you know write a big image back out to the um, to the frame buffer, or, or so, you know back to the, whatever. I don't know. Uh, DMA buffers thing. When uh, when when it, when it, uh, a new DM, DMA buffer is allocated by the driver, the kernel allocator actually tells the VTD unit about that region and says this is, you know, this region should be allowed to be written to by this device and read from by this device and that's all. So basically now when DMA requests come in on the PCE, uh, PCIe bus and they go through the um, VTD unit, it just sort of says yay or nay uh, to, to, to each of those requests. So if, you're, if your device is denied access, uh, you see one of these messages, VTD fault in your, uh, in your console, you can actually set a, um, a in the NPCI uh, flag bootargs to fault when that happens, like, sorry, uh, panic when that happens, which is not fun. And we saw lots and lots and lots of those when we were developing this. Um, so that's basically what I just said, right? So you've got your device connected to the PCIe bus, and then it goes now through the VTD, VTD unit in, inside the, the um, platform controller hub, and then goes into the CPU. So VTD gets first dibs on telling you to get fucked. So this is actually now on all machines, uh, sort of 2012-ish onwards, you know, including this this uh, presentation one. Uh, so Ivy Bridge onwards has well as well, has has yeah. Um, requires operating system config, as I said. The kernel's got to actually set it up. It's not just a you know for free hardware um, control. Um, so yeah, basically means that th these tricks don't work on a new machine running a new OS. Um, uh, as it was added to, uh, to OS X's uh, IOPCI family driver in 10.8.2. So if you're running an Ivy Bridge or later machine with 10.8.2 or later, you're all good. Um, I think Windows before Windows 8 or maybe Windows 8.1, someone can probably correct me, Shift Reduce can probably correct me. I, I think it doesn't uh, actually configure VTD at all, so it would still be vulnerable. Is that right? Yep. Thanks. Um, <laughs> I was looking for, around for a nod and I see him at the back there. Thanks, mate. Um, Linux actually does a much better job of configuring VTD, and it like its code's heaps cleaner. Apparently, says Sam, who's looked through it. I don't know anything about. It. Um, but yeah, so it actually sets up a domain. I do know a couple of things about it because Sam told me. It sets up a domain um, per like per device or whatever, and you know has some more fine grained access controls. Yeah. So the Apple VTD code. Uh, well, I so, say so. A domain is allocated to an I/O device on PCI Express by uh, kind of where it sits in the PCI Express tree. Uh, and the Apple code only has one domain. Like everything is under the same domain, whereas the Linux code is real nice uh, because of all the kind of hypervisor stuff it uses VTD for. It actually sets up domains properly and uses more than one. So yeah. So that's basically what I just said. Um, you know, if you're running a new machine with new software, you're okay. And if you're running a new machine with old software, you're silly and should upgrade it. Um, if you're running an old machine. You're, you know, if you're running a, thanks, Sandy Bridge machine, you're in, you're um, probably in trouble. Um, so that's that's pretty much it. Um, I think the ne like the next steps for this research are obviously going to be to make this um, monstrosity a little bit smaller. Um, this is, you know, far more hardware than is actually required. It was, it's an off-the-shelf uh, development board with a huge number of peripherals that we're not using, um, like you know, SFP stuff and fucking the mezzanine thing and like all this other junk, and then an external uh, Thunderbolt to PCI Express board. So 
I think you know we'll probably build a um, a small board that's just a FPGA Thunderbolt controller, uh, bus powered, you know, nice and neat. Um, and obviously, uh, it doesn't actually require the the attacking computer to be present. We're just using it to talk to talk to it over serial, you know, for demonstration and sort of visibility purposes. Um, so it could probably be a pretty small self-contained device you can plug in, press button, unlock screen, or pr plug in, put SDXC card in, um, dump all memory to SDXC card. So that's probably uh, one of the next steps. Also, we're looking at VTD in a little bit more detail, um, getting to know a bit more about it, so maybe, maybe that's some uh, future research. Um, so there's been a few other people that have done some interesting uh, papers and talks and stuff about it in the last few years, like Invisible Things Labs and some other dudes, I don't know, done some cool stuff. Um, Maybe, I don't know, see if we can not require a driver, find some other tricks. Um, and probably full memory capture, so it's actually useful for volatility. Because um, at the moment it's pretty much just a stunt hack, so, yeah. Sweet. So we've got a few little references there. There's probably more things that we should have added to that, but um, hit us yeah, up if you want I any more references. I can highly recommend <laughs> the uh, PCI Express specification. Oh, yeah. It's a great way to fall asleep at night. The VTD one's actually really exciting as well. Um, I think that's pretty much about it. Um, yeah. Mad props to Thomas Lim for being a legend and letting us come and destroy Singapore again. Um, Brett Moore's not here, so I can't blame my hangover on him. So the blame rests squarely with Thomas for giving me whiskey after I kicked out of the pool last night. So um, yeah, thanks to all those people and stuff. Hey, uh, great demo. Uh, firstly, I'd, I'd like to sympathize for Xilinx tool sucking. I've experienced that in my privilege <laughs> as well, and I really sympathize. Yeah, How long did your bitstream generation take, usually? I assume like a few hours. Oh, no, this, um, this device is actually pretty small. The bitstream's about a megabyte, but it does take around half an hour. But, oh. yeah, in my uni work, I've got a much bigger FPGA, and, yeah, it can take 12 24 hours to generate the bitstream, yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, what clock speed did, could you guys achieve on the FPGA? Because I assume the PCI Express runs at a pretty high clock rate, right? Yeah, so this is a, like a lower generation FPGA. So that's why it's got those device specific features, because the PCI Express has to run at 250 megahertz. So it's got specific hardware on there that can run that fast, that isn't logic. Uh, and I think we interface with it at 100 megahertz. So yeah, pretty, it's pretty easy to achieve 100 megahertz but 250 is a lot harder on a device like this. And uh, how did you guys connect the microblaze to the PCI Express board? Uh, it's connected to the serial. It's connected to serial, so there's a UART on the board, and it's connected to the AXI PCI thing, which is what is actually connected to the PCI Express Bridge. port. Yeah. Bridge. Yeah, so the microblaze isn't directly connected to it. There's that. AXI bus and the AXI core in between it. And uh, just last, uh, last question. Uh, so which part of your uh, system sends the DMA request? Is it the hardware component or is it, uh, is it the microblaze processor sends the DMA requests? Uh, no, it's that AXI PCI core. There's like a, there's a DMA thing to that which is memory mapped on that bus which you know you write to kind of the same way the driver does telling the other device what to do, uh, and so it goes and it does that and then interrupts the microblaze when it's done. And it chucks it all into, there's actually 128 megs of DDR2 on here and it puts it all in there. So the, the whole design of, of using a microcontroller, the microblaze bus and then FPGA, um, is that just, you did that just because your development board just had a FPGA or, or is it, isn't it just much easier to use a normal microcontroller or an ARM core or whatever, attach it to an FPGA via bus? Uh, I mean, you know, why, why you know, implement the, F, the microcontroller in, in, on the FPGA? Oh, it's just a lot easier to kind of be able to write C code. Uh, yeah, that, sure. That I mean, I understand it. why microcontroller. I just don't get why not a normal microcontroller? Well, because, because basically what you said, the dev board we have doesn't have a microcontroller on right. board, but it's just, it's, it's, there's plenty of logic there to, to implement the uh, microcontroller as microblaze on the, right, on, the, right, on the device. So that was the only, if, if we were building something from scratch, we may have used the hardware, you know, a hard microcontroller or, you know, a zinc um, uh, chip that has a hard, you know, ARM yep. core or something like that. I'm just asking because the, the DDK that Nedos uh, did, he has an ARM core wishbone and an FPGA. I mean, I'm not sure if yeah. he would be able to run PCI on that. You probably have to have like a dedicated FP, uh, PCI module again because it's not fast enough. I don't but think, I don't think the, 
I don't think the um, the FPGA that they use on the DDK can do um, PCI yeah. Express. So you would need to have an external device again connected via some of the IOs, yeah. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so having a micro kind of on in your fabric is so common, in fact, that <laughs> Xilinx have made a, a chip with a dedicated dual arm core on it. So it's so often used that they've been like, all right, well, we might as well put this in heart, like its own hardware. Uh, and they're like, they run at one gigahertz as opposed to ours running at one megahertz. So, yeah. <laughs> 100 megahertz. What was the uh, device that you were actually emulating? The, the, the mistaking the Apple? Uh, it was the Apple SDXC slot. So this is the um, SD card slot, basically. And um, are there other devices that you could alternatively use which might yeah. provide you more access? Um, yeah, quite possibly. Um, we, we, that's that's another thing that we sort of started to look into as well, like um, the the different uh, regions that are that are the DMA buffers that are allocated by different devices, device drivers. So like a GPU might allocate bigger DMA buffers and give us bigger windows of memory that we can actually access with VTD. We didn't really go into the, you know actually the fine grained uh, nature of the uh, the way that VTD limits our access. But um, yeah, there, there's still certain memory regions that we can access. Um, Using that driver, but there's probably more with other drivers. So it's you know possible that you could also you know go through a whole series of drivers and see what what memory regions they can access and and, and read them all. So, uh, hello, uh, excellent talk. How do you make the FPGA work in a Mac? Ah, oh, the VMware. It's impossible. <laughs> uh, just, just, it's another question. Did you try uh, make the transceiver, uh, you know, do uh, wear stuff in the bus? So so you basically do a transceiver fussing. Uh, we don't really have uh, on on this board. There's not really a lot of access to that that kind of level of stuff because the, the the actual transceiver is implemented in hardware in the, in the Spartan Six because it only runs at 100 megahertz, as Sam said. So that you don't really have a whole lot of access to to change the parameters of that. If you were using a like what Kintex or um, or Vertex or whatever, you could or you know other platforms um, that that have uh, high clock speed where you can actually implement the transceiver in logic, then you could probably hope. Yeah, we, we haven't explored that at all, but it's, yeah, it seems like an interesting, uh, inter interesting thing to explore as well.